Johnny Two Face here, back with another reaction video. This time, I'm reacting to how Rome conquered the ancient Celts by by kings and generals. Now, since I am I am still continuing with this Celtic documentary series by kings and generals, and um, well, mostly because it's a history that doesn't get talked about a lot, and and it's not the easiest either due to the lack of historical records. So. So if you haven't seen my reactions to the other episodes in this series, I suggest you check them out before checking this one out. And also check out Kings and Gen the Kings and Generals channel. So, um, usual disclaimer when I react to anything historical, if I don't show so much what is considered a proper reaction, it is probably obvious that I don't know much about the subject at hand, and if I do know anything, I'll most likely uh, give my input or... Or ask any curious questions, which hopefully will be answered in the comments below. And yes, my voice is different because it hasn't recovered yet. So, just get it out of the way. So, the link to the original video will be in the description down below. Please go and subscribe to, <coughs> excuse me, Kings and Generals, which is another great history channel on YouTube. And feel free to recommend more if you if you feel like it. So, with that out of the way, let's. Get this up on screen and see how this plays out. In the 3rd century BC, the Celtic peoples were still the masters of continental Europe. Mm -hmm. A hundred years earlier, Gaulish warriors had set Rome ablaze, yep. marking the lowest point in the history of the young republic. But it would soon recover, mm -hmm. and as the eagle spread its wings, the sun yep. had begun to set on the Celtic world. Welcome to the third video in our series on the ancient Celts, where we will cover the Roman conquests that brought an end to the independence of the Gauls yeah. from Iberia in the west to Anatolia in the east. <coughs> the sponsor of this video, Endo, yeah. is a uniquely useful application that creates personalized soundscapes to help you focus, relax, or sleep. If you're having a hard time focusing on your studies or work, suffering from stress and anxiety which makes you unproductive, Feel free. Using the link in the description, we'll get Feel free to check them out if you're interested. This will also support our channel. Mm -hmm. After winning the Second Samnite War, the Roman Republic had. Ex yeah, because bear in mind, Rome, Rome was not the great empire just yet. And, and if you remember from the last episode, the Celts were defeated in Greece. At at Thermopylae expanded its territory hmm. and become the hegemons of central Italy. Yeah. In 298 BC, the Third Samnite War began, with the Etruscans, the Samnites and the Gallic Senones tribe all trying to curb the growing power of Rome. Hmm. The Senones had been the terror of the Republic <coughs> as they sacked Rome two yeah. generations earlier, and in 295 they massacred a Roman army outside the Etruscan city of Clusium. Mm. With Livy claiming that the heads of the legionnaires were mounted on the Gallic spears as they sang their triumphant war songs. Wow. Yet the tides turned later that year, when mm. the Senones and their Samnite allies clashed with the Romans outside Centium, where they were crushed. Taking advantage of their victory in the Third Samnite War, mm. the Romans pushed north, conquering the lands mm. of the Senones by 283 BC where they established a military colony called Sena Gallica. Mm. The sack of Rome had finally been avenged. This was a critical junction in the Gallo-Roman story, mm. for the Gallic illusion of invincibility had begun yeah. to dim. But what had changed since the sack of Rome to allow the armies of the Republic to finally be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against the most mm -hmm. terrifying warriors in the ancient world? After being humbled by their Italic cousins during the beginning of the Second Samnite War in 315 BC, the Romans realized that the phalanx they had inherited from the Etruscans and Greeks was not a versatile fighting formation, especially on uneven terrain or against a particularly malleable foe. With the goal of developing a more dynamic standing army, they created the innovative Manipula system. Under this system, the standard Roman legions were organized into three okay. rows, 
each one comprised of a checkerboard-like pattern of titular maniples, a basic unit of soldiers containing 120 heads. Compared to a phalanx, which consisted of single, conjoined rows of men, the dynamic maniples were able to maneuver about more effectively by virtue of being separate units. Okay. The manipular legions were organized into three standard rows. The front lines were made up of Hastati, fresh recruits. Behind them were the Principes, who were battle-hardened soldiers. Yep. Finally, the back row was made up of Triarii, the most veteran elites, and the last mm. resort in battle. Okay. Originally manufactured to battle the mounted Samnites, mm. the manipular system soon proved effective against the Celts. Mm. As you will recall, Gallic warfare revolved around using fear tactics to plummet enemy morale mm. before utilizing a single ferocious charge aimed to break their lines. This had worked yeah. in 390 BC, but the new maniples were far better equipped to weather the Gallic onslaught. Yeah, because over time tactics will evolve. So I think this is where the Celts. Well, these Celts learned the hard way that you can't use the same techniques all the time. And they would have to devise their own. That's if they did. I'm not entirely sure yet. But I think in this episode or future episodes, it will tell me like if they do, if, if they do or don't evolve their techniques. Their three-line reserve system hmm. meant that no single charge could rout hmm. a Roman legion. As even if the front line of Hestati broke, there were fresh, experienced Principes and Triarii to replace them. Mm. Moreover, the general maneuverability of the Manipular Legions allowed them to counter the effectiveness of more mobile Gallic units like the mm. War Chariot. It should, however, be noted that mm. these innovations did not make the Romans invulnerable to Gallic no. warfare. As the protracted, centuries-long invasion of the Celtic world continued, Many tribes mm. would adopt styles of battle better suited for countering the professional Roman war machine, yeah. scoring many victories that delayed the imperial mm. advance into Gaulish lands. In the decades after their conquest of the Senones' territory, Rome would become entangled in several other wars, first locking horns with mm. Pyrrhus and his lumbering war elephants, then mm. with Carthage for the first time. By the end of these okay. wars, Rome had become the undisputed master of Peninsula Italy, mm. and the way into the Celtic lands of the Po Valley was now open. In 32 <coughs> BC, the Senate began parceling off former Senones territory to their poorer citizens. The other Celtic tribes in the area assumed that this Roman policy of aggressive frontier settlement meant that expansion into mm. their lands was next. Thus, the Boii in Subris and Turisci spearheaded a campaign to push the Republic back to Latium. They also paid a company of particularly wolfish Gallic mercenaries from the far side of the Alps, the Gaeseti, okay. to join their cause. If you recall from our last chapter, when we talked about how some Gallic warriors fought completely naked, that was these guys. Okay. As the head of 70,000 footmen, horsemen and charioteers, the Boii and their allies quickly mm. overran Roman Etruria by 225 BC, plundering their way south. Near the town of Fesulae, the Celts were finally confronted by a Roman mm. army, and by now they knew better than to charge the Roman maniples head on. Yeah. They made clever use of decoy fires and mm. the cover of darkness to ambush their enemy from behind, massacring 6,000 Roman soldiers and forcing mm. them to retreat. The Gauls were not a mob of blood-drunk barbarians, but dynamic, mm. cunning and adaptable warriors who refused to underestimate their foe. Nevertheless, upon hearing that a much larger relief force, led by Roman consul Aemilius Pappus, was on their tail, the Gallic allies decided to quit while they were ahead and return home with mm. their plunder, an inauspicious decision. In the narrow hill valley outside the town of Telema, oh, the walls were caught and pincered between two consular armies. What followed was a massacre, yeah. outnumbered two to one and sandwiched on two fronts. Mm. The lightly armoured and in some cases fully naked Celts mm. were culled by a hail of Roman javelins mm. before being cut down by the seemingly tireless lines of Roman maniples. Ancient sources claim over 40,000 Celts were massacred in this battle. 
The defeat at Telamon shows us another disadvantage that hamstrung the Gauls, disunity. Celtic leaders systematically prioritized the needs of their own tribe, and even when different yeah. tribes worked together, it was always a temporary measure. Yeah. Before the campaign, the Romans had paid off the Boii tribe's rivals, the Kenomani and Veneti, mm. to invade Boii lands, forcing the Boii to keep a significant portion of their warriors north to defend their borders, rather than bring the full brunt of their army down upon Rome. Celtic disunity also played a major role in the disparity in the quality of equipment between the Roman and Gallic warriors. As we covered in the last chapter, the Celts were incredibly skilled metallurgists, but their fragmented tribal society prevented them from pooling their resources together to arm everyone equally. Rome, on the other hand, was a single united polity with advanced yep. infrastructure and central administration, able to churn out professional legions equipped with standardized gear. After their victory at Telamon, the Romans pushed deep into the Celtic Alps, wow. occupying much of northern Italy. Not that they would be able to savor the sweetness of victory long, for only a few years later, round two would erupt between the Republic and Carthage, which this time was led by Hannibal Barker. In one of the most iconic military maneuvers in history, Hannibal aimed to surprise the Romans by marching through the treacherous Alps. There he was hailed as a liberator by the Boii and Insubris, who joined the Carthaginian army en masse. Hmm. However, some tribes, like the Kenomani, declared their loyalty to Rome, and thus had to be defeated by Hannibal's forces. Nevertheless, at the Battle of Cannae, where 30,000 Romans were slaughtered, mm -hmm. much of the Carthaginian army was composed of Gallic mercenaries, yeah. as well as Celtiberians, who we will get to later. Since we all know how Hannibal's story ends, Let's fast forward a little bit. Not yet, I don't. As Rome emerged out of the Second Punic War, bloodied but mm. victorious, they shifted their attention back northwards, mm. where the Boii and Insubris continued to resist Roman expansion. Even the Kenumani, who had benefited little from their friendship with Rome, turned against mm. their former allies. Nevertheless, Rome had put down these insurrections by 191 BC, and finally conquered all the Gauls of northern Italy. Mm. Now let us move westward and explore a lesser known theatre in which the Roman eagle clashed with the Celtic boarhead. Since the dawn of recorded history, the Iberian Peninsula had been a highly cosmopolitan land. Mm. By the 3rd century BC, it was home to a variety of Celts and non-Celtic peoples like the Lusitanians, Turditani, Aquitani and Iberians mm whose languages and cultures probably predated the arrival of the Celts in the region. Wow. The Celt-Iberians, who lived in northwestern Spain, were a divergent Celtic culture, probably mm. created from intermixing between Celtic migrants okay. and the native Iberians. They spoke a Celtic mm. language that was very different from the Gaulish languages of the rest of continental Europe. Mm. Much like in Italy, the story of the Celts in Iberia is tied to the eternal struggle between Rome and Carthage. The North African Empire had colonies along the peninsula's south coast for centuries, mm. but during the interbellum between the First and Second Punic Wars, Hamilcar Barca mm. and his son Hannibal had pushed deep inland. Mm. Celtiberian tribes like the Capitani put up fierce mm. resistance, but were soon subdued. Iberia would consequently become one of the most crucial theatres of the Second Punic War. When Rome won, it replaced Carthage as the local hegemon. Mm. This put the Celt-Iberians on their frontier, and border skirmishes began almost immediately. Mm. Tensions reached a boiling point in 181 BC, okay, might be a when the Romans spoiler. began importing thousands of Latin colonists, much to mm. the locals' chagrin. In response, an alliance of Celt-Iberian tribes mustered some 35,000 men and mm. faced off a consular army led by proconsul Quintus Flaccus <coughs> Flaccus near Ebura, but despite putting up dogged resistance, they were defeated. Two years later, a campaign spearheaded by Roman praetor Sempronius Gracchus grinded his way across Hispania's many ardently defended hill forts, eventually bringing much of Celt-Iberia mm. to heel. Gracchus imposed order through the taking of noble hostages, 
the founding of Roman towns, and the encouragement of Celtiberians okay. to enlist in the Roman army. This worked for a time, but in 153 BC, war broke out again when the Celtiberian Titi tribe rose up in revolt alongside their Lusitani allies. Okay. This insurrection was eventually put down too, but not before the Iberians had inflicted thousands of Roman casualties, including a Teutoburg-esque victory where 6,000 legionaries were massacred by ambush in a thick forest. Another great revolt would erupt in the following decades, but in 133 BC, the great fortress of Numantia, which had long been the heart of Celtiberian resistance, had fallen into Roman hands. After this, most of Hispania fell under Roman control. Nevertheless, insurrection and rebellion remained endemic in the region. The entire peninsula didn't come under the empire's domination until after the Cantabrian Wars in 19 BC, rounding out a mind-boggling 200 years of struggle. Paradoxically, one of the first territories the Romans conquered outside Italy was also the one it struggled the longest against mm. to completely pacify, a testimony to the valour of the Iberians. It is now that our story shifts east, to the sun-baked highlands of central Anatolia. Mm. Here dwelt the Galatians, a collection of mm. Celtic tribes who had been transplanted into the region as a byproduct of King Brennos's failed invasion of Greece in 279 BC. Living amidst a sea of Greek-speaking successor states to Alexander's Macedonian Empire, the Galatians had adopted many of the trappings of classical Greek culture. They primarily made their fortunes as career mercenaries, as their Gallic ferocity made them the ideal shock troopers mm. in any ambitious Macedonian king's army. For a century, the Gauls of Anatolia earned a fortune pillaging the fortunes of Greek rulers on behalf of other Greek rulers. At the turn of the second century, the Galatian tribes attached themselves to the army of the Hellenic world's mightiest king, Antiochus III of the Seleucid Empire. Okay. One has to imagine that the Gauls assumed this would be a contract like any other. They were wrong. Antiochus was engaged in a struggle for hegemony over the Greek-speaking world with none other than the Roman Republic. Inevitably, the Seleucid king's ambitions would turn to ash in his mouth when his cataphracts, war elephants, scythes, chariots, and Gallic mercenaries were decisively defeated by the Romans and their Pergamene allies at the Battle of Magnesia in 191 BC. With the Seleucids humbled by the Scipio brothers, the mm. Roman consul Gnaeus Manlius Vulso proposed that the Republic should expand into the highlands of Galatia. The official pretext for war was that the Galatians had fought alongside the Seleucids, but in truth, Rome was probably lusting after the rich plunder that the Anatolian Gauls yep, had accumulated likely. over their century of mercenary work. In 189 BC, a coalition of 50,000 Galatians from the Talistabogi and Trochmi tribes faced off against the legions at the foot of Mount Olympus. Like their kinsmen in Europe, the Galatians also fought with little armour and were thusly shredded by a shower of Roman javelins. In the aftermath, 40,000 Galatian men, women and children were captured and sold into slavery. Anatolian Gauls remained nominally independent, but increasingly bound to the will of Rome. After the Republic absorbed Pergamon in 133 BC, the Galatians became a useful buffer state, who the Romans used to wage a proxy war on their Cappadocian and Pontic enemies. During the Mithridatic Wars, the Galatians were faithful allies to Pompey the Great in his struggle against the Pontic king Mithridates. In 25 BC, after nearly 150 years of gradual Romanization, Galatia was okay. finally annexed and became a province of the empire. Now let us dial back the clock to the 2nd century BC and return to northern Italy. With the Alps in Rome's control, the proverbial door was open for its legions to march into the region of the Gallic world roughly corresponding to modern France, the very heart of the Celtic Latin world. Mm. The catalyst for this came in the form of the Greek city of Massalia, which had a complicated centuries-long relationship with the Celtic tribes they were surrounded by. 
by the 2nd century BC. They had also become close allies and trading partners with the rising star that was Rome. So in 154 BC, when the Gallic Saluvii tribe threatened to invade them, the Greeks called for the Romans to help. The Republic was happy for an excuse to send its legions beyond the Alps, and helped defend Massalia from the Saluvii twice, once in 154 and again in 125. After the second bout, the Romans magnanimously offered to assume control of Massalia's hinterlands to protect them from further Gallic incursions. They wanted the Greeks, it. caring more about trade than territorial integrity, mm. agreed. Meanwhile, the defeated okay. Saluvi king, Tutomatulos, had fled north to the territory of the Allobroges, who were mm. closely allied to the Arverni. This gave the Romans the perfect casus belli to pursue an expansionist campaign into the rich lands of these two tribes. Under the pretext of chasing Tutomatulos, they invaded the territory of the Allobroges and Arverni, and by 121 BC had mm. conquered much of southern France. They incorporated it into their empire as the province of Transalpine Gaul, which meant Gaul beyond the Alps, mm. named in juxtaposition to Cisalpine Gaul, Gaul within the Alps. After the establishment of the province of Transalpine Gaul, later renamed Gallia Narbonensis, mm -hmm. the frontier between the Celts and the Romans remained relatively stable mm -hmm. and even friendly for the better part of a century. One example of this was the Celtic Federation of Noricum, which by the late 2nd century BC had developed a mutually symbiotic relationship with Rome. The skilled metallurgists of the region provided the Republic with much of the steel they needed to equip their legions, and in turn, the legions provided them with military protection. Wow. Consequently, when the Germanic, Cimbri and Teutonese people invaded Noricum in 113 BC, the Romans were quick to defend their Gallic allies. At the turn of the 1st century BC, trade between Rome and various Celtic tribes had begun to flourish with a complex system of trade networks and treaties existing between them. It can be easy to imagine commerce between these two mm. as a one-sided relationship whereby the barbarous mm. Gauls coveted the riches of the Romans, mm. but this was not the case. The Gauls profited greatly off Roman wine, but Rome also had much to gain in Celtic goods, from their excellent metalwork to other radical Gallic mm. inventions like the wooden barrel and so. Mm. Nevertheless, the relationship between the Latin and Celtic worlds would deteriorate once more in the 15th BC, when a certain Gaius Julius Caesar became mm. governor of Cisalpine and Transalpine Gaul, setting the stage for perhaps the single most iconic campaign of conquest in Roman history. What began, at least on paper, as an expedition mm -hmm. to prevent the migration of hostile tribes into Roman territory, soon evolved into the yep. full-scale subjugation of the entire Gallic heartland, resulting in an immortal duel mm. between the erstwhile Triumvir and the valiant Arverni mm. chieftain Vercingetorix. This is the most famous clash between the Celtic and Roman worlds, but it's also the one we'll devote the least time to in this video, mm -hmm. as we've already made a 90-minute long documentary exhaustively covering it, which we'll make available in the description below. Regardless, Feel free to check that we all know how the story ends. When Vercingetorix rode out of Elysia and threw his arms at the feet of the Roman consul who had defeated him, the independence of the Gallic world had come to an end. By the year 50 BC, the Gallic world of continental Europe had all but disappeared. The Celtic territories of Eastern and Central oh. Europe that had not been subsumed by Rome were eventually replaced by waves of migration by the Dacians, Iranic Sarmatian pastoralists, and early Germanic tribes. The rest, of course, were now under the shadow of the Imperial Eagle's wing. Nevertheless, Celtic culture persisted for centuries under Roman rule, and in one foggy corner of the known world, of they even retained their fierce independence. In the next episode, we will explore the life of the Gauls under Roman rule, and explore the Empire's interactions with the free Celtic peoples of the British Isles. So make sure you are subscribed okay. and have pressed the bell button to see the next video in the series. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members. 
whose ranks you can join that'll... via the links in the description. And that'll do it. This has been another interesting video by Kings and Generals. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, yeah. Uh, it's been a really interesting video, and um, I'm definitely looking forward to to the other episodes in this series. And I think I've in this episode I probably got a bit spoiled for the end of the Han end of Hannibal. So um, so yeah. Anyway, if you like this reaction, please like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you in the next.